Hey there YouTube, this is the Mr. Roboto back with another video. Uh, if you've seen my previous videos, you've probably seen this guy and wondered why do I have a robot in a video that has to do with knives and flashlights and pinball machines and anything else. Well, that's because my profession that uh, affords me the ability to buy fun toys uh, is in the robotics industry. So, um, I had mentioned before in a previous video that I was going to start a series on Robotics 101 for all of you out there that uh, may be looking to get into this uh, vastly expanding and accelerating industry um, in the engineering world. It's very exciting. So, in the first topic um, of this series, we're going to describe exactly what is a robot in the context of what I'm describing. So, robots. Lots of people like to throw that buzzword around. But what exactly is a robot? By definition, a robot is a mechanical, electromechanical system that is pre programmed and is able to do a task without the direct intervention of an operator. So, a battle bot, for instance, is a um, essentially a glorified remote control car. All right? I'm not bashing battle bots or anything like that, but you have a, a, a vehicle that drives around in an arena with a weapon on it, which is very cool. But that machine is being directly controlled by a human via joysticks or some sort of remote control. So by definition, that really is not a robot. Um, then if you get into um, other things that are technically robots, so for instance, um, Lego robots, um, the Mindstorms, for instance, those are good examples of a, a robot that that um, you know you do have to program and it has sensor inputs and things like that and that is a very good way to be introduced to logic programming and things like that but um, it is not what we are going to be talking about um, the type of robots that that we will be talking about um, on this channel in this series of robotics 101 are uh, specifically industrial robots um, so um, what is an industrial robot? Okay, so uh, there are many different forms, many different types of industrial robot. Um, the uh, um, in general, a, a an industrial robot is uh, comprised of um, a manipulator, which is the mechanical portion of the robot that actually moves around and does things like this piece in front of you. And then on the back of that robot, you'll have cable, uh, cables that attach to the back to these plugs. And then those cables will go to an electrical enclosure or electrical cabinet that will actually have the brains of the robot in that box. That is the robot controller. <clears throat> the robot controller has all of the power distribution and everything that you need to move these joints around. They'll have servo drives and power supplies and things like that. Um, so when you combine a robot manipulator or, an, or a mechanical manipulator like this with a, a box, an electrical enclosure, a robot controller, uh, and then typically you would have some sort of human machine interface which would um, which is most commonly known as a teach pendant um, that's where the operator actually programs the robot from and is able to interact with the robot when you combine those three together now you have an industrial robot industrial robots um, today we're going to just be talking about the manipulator okay so, the manipulator is the thing that everyone sees on TV. Um, it gets all the fanfare. Um, the controller and the teach pendant are sort of 
supporting cast, but um, nothing, uh, you know, no three of those can do anything without each other. So um, the uh, manipulator itself is actually uh, probably the simplest um, portion when it comes to um, electronics, uh, but is definitely the most uh, complicated portion of a robot when it comes to mechanicals. So um, if you were a mechanical engineer in the robotics industry and you wanted to design robots and work for a company like KUKA, which is German, or ABB, which is Swedish, uh, Motoman, Yaskawa Motoman, which is uh, Japanese, Fanic, which is Japanese as well, Kawasaki, uh, there's a, a whole host of them. If you wanted to work in that industry as a mechanical engineer, there's a good chance that you would probably be designing the mechanicals of this arm, the castings, the gearboxes, uh, things like that. <clears throat> so, uh, with a uh, mechanical um, manipulator, you have things called axes. Okay, axes are points of rotation on a robot arm. Think of axes kind of like the joints in your body. Uh, they connect a link. Um, so imagine your upper arm uh, and your lower arm. Those are two links that are connected by a joint, which is an elbow in your body. Okay. So inside of each one of these joints, you have a servo motor, which is a, an electric motor with a position uh, encoder built in so that the uh, robot controller can tell exactly where the robot is in space. Um, and then usually that motor is tied in with a um, gearbox of some sort. A planetary gearbox is very common in the robot industry. Um, and uh, if you don't know what a planetary gearbox is, I'll uh, touch on that later on. Um, but uh, you have all these different joints that are able to be moved by a combination of a servo motor and a gearbox. So um, these joints are um, usually uh, numbers. Um, they're numbered or they have letters depending on the manufacturer, but most commonly they are numbered. So um, they always start at the base of the robot. So your first joint would be axis one, which would be your waist. Okay. And then the next one would be axis two. And then axis three, axis four, axis five, axis six, and axis seven. Now, this robot I use in my videos a lot because I think it's one of the most beautiful robots on the market. This is not a very common robot. Um, to have seven axes um, is, is somewhat of a rare thing. Uh, you really only need that seventh axis in uh, certain situations. It is much more common to see a six axis robot, something like this, okay? So in this case, you've got axis one around the base. Okay, we've got axis two. All right. Axis three. Here. Axis four. Here. Axis five. Here. And then axis six. Those six axes are going to give you a similar flexibility of motion to what you could expect with a human arm. 
And that's why most manufacturers have settled on six axes. For the uh, cost-benefit ratio of um, flexibility without having to add extra gearboxes and things like that and motors. <clears throat> um, so, um, some manufacturers I mentioned don't use numbers. Uh, some of them use letters. So, for instance, if you have experience with uh, Yaskawa Motorman robots, instead of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, it will be... S L U R B and T slurp, and that's kind of silly. Um, they do actually stand for um, uh, different terminology that um, Yaskawa Motorman likes to use, but um, in uh, in Kuka, for instance, um, they call them axis one through six. In FANUC, they call them J1 through 6, joint 1 through 6. Um, so between all the different robot brands, there's a lot of commonality there, but um, in general, they're, they're the same thing, except for maybe Yaskawa and maybe a couple others that use a different naming convention. <clears throat> all right, so within these six axes, um, they're really broken into two categories, okay? Uh, you have your major axes and your minor axes. So your majors are considered to be your um, heavy movers um, that are designed to do the majority of the lifting and also uh, the majority of the motion. Okay, so axis one is a big swing axis. Two is a big up and down axis. Three, okay. Axis 1, 2, and 3, those together, are what's known as your major axes. Okay. 4, 5, and 6. 4, 5, and, and 6 are known as your minor axes. And they call them the minor axes because they're really for fine-tuned positioning. As you can see here, this motion isn't really going to do a lot of moving of the object on the end of the robot, but it it is going to be instrumental in the positioning. So think of four, five, and six as a wrist. So you've got a wrist, a wrist, and a wrist to be able to spin. Okay? And then think of one, two, and three like a shoulder, an elbow, Okay, and forearm. Um, so those are your major and minor axes. Okay, so um, this model I have here is very highly detailed, and I'll probably be using this quite a bit because it has wires and motors and everything, and it's a very interesting model. Um, it's my favorite of all my robot models. Um, that's why I don't keep it at work. I like to sit it at home and look at it and play with it, but um, uh, it's very descriptive. So um, on the back of the robot, um, you'll see this is a representation of where all the cables would attach to the robot from the robot controller. So usually you're going to have two large cables. One is going to be powering of all the motors on the robot, the motors and the brakes. And then the other one is going to be all of the encoder data, uh, the position data coming back from the um, um, positional encoders on the motors. Um, then you'll have um, air supply and power supply and some sort of communication supply to uh, be able to talk to uh, the piece that mounts on the end of the robot. Um, so if you notice here, this is a, a good uh, representation of a motor that would be powering a robot axis. Okay, so this uh, portion here is the motor. And on the end of the motor, you have um, a brake 
and then a uh, encoder. So the encoder plus the motor makes it a servo motor. The encoder plus a brake plus a motor makes it a braked servo motor. Okay. And the brake is very important in this type of robot because if you turned off power to your robot in this position without a brake, your robot's going to fall. And that's bad. If that falls, when you lose power and you are a programmer standing inside of the cell, you get crushed. So the brakes are very important. Okay. So in this case, this motor shaft would be going through the center and then down into here. And then down in the bottom of this, you would have a gearbox. You would have a, um, um, a, a, um, a pinion and then most likely a ring gear down here that's going to create this rotary motion. Okay. And then here you um, have the same thing, another motor brake servo combination, but this motor is coming into a gearbox in here. This motor in, or this gearbox is more likely to be a planetary gear or something like that. Okay. Um, so I had mentioned planetary gears, um, and, uh, why they're so good and why they're so important. Um, let's go over to the board and I'll drew, draw a little description of what a planetary gear is. So a planetary gear has an outside housing like this, okay, with lots of little teeth along the outside of that housing and then bolted to that would be the link of the robot that's actually rotating in different directions okay then inside of that you'll have a gear that's connected to the servo motor that we just talked about. Okay. And then inside of that, you'll have a series of gears in here. Okay. These are the planetary gears, okay? So as this gear rotates, it then rotates these gears, which then rotate this outer link. And as this middle gear rotates, these gears rotate around that gear, and they sort of orbit the center gear, okay? So you can think of this as like, the sun in our solar system, and then these are the planets. That's why they call them a planetary gearbox. Now the advantage of this is it's very compact, it's very strong because there's lots of uh, gear teeth um, transmitting torque instead of just one gear. So, um, um, and then it also um, eliminates a lot of inaccuracy uh, due to uh, something uh, we call backlash, okay? And backlash in a gear simply means that if you have two gears, okay, like this, if there's any space between these teeth, all right, as this gear rotates, and this gear then gets that torque transmitted to it, that space there means that this gear is going to wobble back and forth before it actually touches these teeth and then transmits that rotation to this gear. Backlash isn't very good when you need lots of accuracy. So what I mean by that is if you want this to rotate exactly two degrees this direction and you need this gear to rotate exactly two degrees this rotation or this direction, you need a very tight tolerance between these teeth. If you don't have that, 
you might rotate two degrees here and you might only get 1.9 degrees here. And that is what we call backlash. So planetary gears help with backlash and they make it more compact. And then they also, um, again, transmit that torque, a lot more torque, more effectively because there's more surface area rather than just a couple of little teeth touching each other. So that's a very simplified, dumbed down version of a planetary gear set. But if you've ever heard that term and wondered, that's what it is. All right. Let's look over here on this robot. This is a heavier duty robot. Um, so this robot has this piece back here. This is called a uh, counterbalance. Okay. A lot of times there's a big coil spring that sits in here and this plunger, as this joint moves down, more gravity is pulling on the arm and it would be very hard for this motor to be able to lift that arm up. So this plunger and this spring help pull the arm back up easily when the motor is rotating in that direction. So it just helps counteract gravity. Okay. Not all robots have this, um, but usually the uh, heavier duty robots do. So um, the last thing we're going to talk about today is how they um, specify or rate robots. So um, robots are uh, um, in general uh, rated by payload and reach. Okay, But there's also one other important thing that a lot of people forget about. And if you're in the um, industry of uh, designing robot applications like I am, you have to pay attention to this. And it's very important. It can make, and break, make or break your robot application. So the first one is payload. Okay, So this robot may have a payload of 300 kilograms. Okay. If you need the kilogram to pounds conversion, take your kilograms and multiply by 2.2. Okay. So if it's a 300 kilogram robot, it's 660 pounds. And um, they, uh, the industry uses kilograms because 90% of the world is in metric and um, uh, it's just an easier system, in my opinion, to understand. Um, so if you want to work in this industry and you're in love with inches and, and, um, um, pounds, then you better get over it <laughs> because it's going to be millimeters and uh, kilograms. Um, so, uh, but luckily the conversions are very easy and once you do it enough, you'll just sort of, sort of get used to it and it becomes second nature. But anyways. Uh, so this robot would be able to handle um, 300 kilograms, okay? So what does that mean exactly, all right? Um, that means that on the end of your robot here, there's a bolt pattern, okay? And that bolt pattern is designed to have something attached to it. A robot by itself, a manipulator by itself, really is useless until you bolt something to the end of it, okay? So if you wanted this robot to draw pictures, you would bolt a marker to the end of it. If you wanted it to pick up car panels, you would bolt on the end of it some tooling that had magnets or suction cups on it that could come down and pick up your object, okay? And there's a number of different ways to do that. Um, we'll get into that in another video. But just for now, know that these are designed to have something bolted to the end. So when they say a 300 kilogram payload, they mean that the weight of your tooling plus the weight of the object that you're picking up shouldn't be more than 300 kilograms. There's some other considerations in where the center of gravity of that object is, 
uh, in relation to the robot flange, but um, uh, we'll, we'll go over that in another video. But just know that that's what the payload is talking about, all right? The second way that these robots are rated is by reach, okay? So if you take this guy out and you stretch him as far as he can go, what is the distance or what is the swing radius of this robot, okay? Now, this isn't a very useful position for a robot, but it gives you a good uh, base uh, starting point to figure out if this robot's long enough for your reach. So if you take the length from here, this flange, this mounting flange face, back to the center of rotation on this axis one, that distance is going to be the reach of the robot. So in this case, this robot in real life is pretty big. This may have a 3.1 meter reach. So 3,100 millimeters. And if you need the metric to inch um, calculation, take 3,100 millimeters, divide by 25.4, and that's how many inches of reach that robot would give you. <clears throat> the last thing that manufacturers don't really publish um, they publish it, but it's usually somewhere buried in a document. Um, um, but it, it's not like right out in the open, it's not right out in the front. Um, is a thing called moment of inertia, okay? So, moment of inertia, what is this, okay? This is a, 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 it sounds like a complicated thing, but really, it's very simple, okay? Now, if you take um, an object, Let's use a, a bar with two weights on the end, okay? And you have a center point where um, this is going to rotate around, okay? If you were to grab this bar and hold it and twist it with your wrist, okay? It would be pretty simple, pretty easy to do maybe, okay? Let's say this weight is... Uh, one kilogram or 2.2 pounds. All right. Now, if you take this same weight, same amount of weight, remember, okay, let's say that this shaft here weighs the same, so everything is the total same weight, and you take this and now you rotate it, it's going to feel harder to rotate, okay? Because when you move a mass away from an axis of rotation, it increases what we call the moment of inertia. All right? The moment of inertia is very important when you have a robot that has an axis that rotates. Okay, so think of this like your wrist. If you have a tool on here that's this big and it has to rotate back and forth and back and forth for whatever its operation is, obviously you want the one on top, not the bottom. But if you do need to have the one on the bottom, you better make sure that that robot has enough strength in its wrist and enough durability in its gearbox to handle that larger moment of inertia. So, as a robot system uh, design engineer, this is something that we have to look at. And a lot of times, we may end up with a robot that has a much higher payload capacity that we don't really need 
but we have to go with that larger robot because we need more wrist inertia. So if we're only picking up something that weighs um, 100 kilograms and we have a 300 kilogram robot, if we have a wrist inertia of 150 kilogram meter squared, just in case you need that again, that is kilogram times meters squared. Okay, that's the unit of moment of inertia. Um, we may end up having a, a, a larger payload robot not needing that payload, but just relying on that higher moment of inertia. All right, so um, that's um, a really basic quick introduction to the manipulator of a robot system. Remember, this is not a robot. It's only a robot with those three things together, okay? Uh, the controller and, um, in some cases, a teach pendant, but not always. <clears throat> All right. So that'll be the end of this lesson. Um, keep looking back for uh, more and more uh, Robotics 101 lessons. And uh, we'll talk about some uh, more advanced things as we move forward. Um, please remember to like and subscribe. And um, check my channel out. Um, I've got some other uh, information or videos on my channel if you're interested in um, knives and flashlights and lots of, uh, you know, sort of gear, you know, pretty much toys. Um, you can check that information out too. So. Uh, with that said, uh, the Mr. Roboto, out.